All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for coming. Uh, we're excited to kick off the afternoon here uh, with David. So uh, David uh, is a third year PhD student at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. Uh, he got his Bachelor in Computer Science uh, from the University of Augsburg in Germany uh, and his Master of Science in Embedded Computing Systems jointly from the University of Southampton in the UK and the Norwegian University of Science and Te Technology. Uh, apart from Firesim, his research interests lie primarily in high level synthesis. Uh, so David, you can take it away. Thank you. Uh, my talk today is about Firesim on mostly the sightings U250 but also a bit on kind of host platforms in general and like how the interaction between host platforms and FireSim works. Yeah. So first of all, why would you want FireSim on a local FPGA? because kind of the whole purpose at first was do everything in the cloud, be able to run massive simulations and kind of benefit from the cloud. So there are definitely use cases where AWS is great and the cloud is super nice, but there are also use cases where it's preferable to kind of not have to use AWS, be able to run things locally, have control of your own infrastructure, especially if you kind of have more experimental simulations where you don't exactly know how long they will run, whether they will produce something useful. You just have kind of a bit more freedom if you don't have like an attached dot, uh, an exact dollar figure attached to each experiment. And in general, I think it's also good for research infrastructure to not be tied to just one cloud provider and instead be kind of accessible more generally. So first I'll go a bit into what kind of interfaces FireSim uses in order to communicate between the host platform, so the um, CPU and the FPGA, and the, specifically the bridges on the FPGA. There's kind of two main interfaces there. There's the MMIO interface that does like all the basic configuration. And in general, if you implement a custom host platform, what you do, is you subclass the sim interface uh, class and then have to provide the read and write functions. And those kind of operate via this MMIO interface and do the basic configuration. And then there's also the DMA interface. The DMA interface is not used for everything, but can kind of provide a lot of benefits and a lot of the cool features that FireSim has. And then the third interface that is kind of not directly tied to the host, but that also needs to be provided by the FPGA is access to RAM. And as you can see, kind of the DMA interface, the RAM interface are quite wide, whereas the MMIO interface is quite narrow. So there's a stark difference there in terms of bandwidth. Then the platform that we primarily target is the Alveo U250. It's a data center FPGA, and it's kind of one step up from the FPGA used on AWS F1 instances, because it has four instead of three superlogic regions. Superlogic regions are uh, dice that are then bonded together using uh, some interface um, to provide like a bigger FPGA in a sense. And the U250 has 1.7 million LUTs, uh, provides a six, uh, 16x uh, PCIe Gen 3 interface and four 16 gigabyte DDR4 channels. Then kind of the obvious way to use the U250 is Vitus or XRT. And that's also the way that's kind of currently available in mainline FireSim. When we started all of this, this was not available. We also looked into using XRT, but in the end decided against it. What XRT does, it is, has a static shell with the PCIe and kind of management uh, functionality and also support for partial reconfiguration via PCIe kind of baked in. And then it only reconfigures part of the FPGA via PCIe. And that means that the PCIe interface kind of always stays up, never goes down and doesn't have to change in any way. But the disadvantage of XRT is that it's really mainly intended for XRT managed HLS kernels. 
and that's kind of visible in a lot of places. And there is now support for user managed kernels uh, that are just implemented in RTL and have an XELite interface uh, to control them and also access to memory. But what is not available is kind of the type of direct DMA interface that FireSim uses on AWS F1. And there are ways around this, but it's kind of not available out of the box. And that means that there's no out of the box support for Tracer V, SimpleNIC, Dramajo, Printbridge, or Trace Doctor, which we heard about earlier today. And those are kind of some of the features that make FireSim really attractive. Then here's a quick look at kind of the interfaces that the AWS shell provides, because this is kind of what we used as a template for deciding what to implement in our shell. There are quite a few interfaces here, but it's really just the DMA, MMIO, and RAM interfaces that are interesting for us. And one thing you can already see here is there are quite a few other interfaces, and that means there's also like some overhead that is included in the AWS shell that is not actually needed for FireSim. And one RAM channel, for example, is always included as part of the shell design with the Fires, uh, IWS F1 shell. And for FireSim, that makes a lot of sense because you all, almost always want main memory, but that's like one of the limitations of this type of fixed shell design in general. And what we then did is directly created a top level design that kind of incorporates the whole FPGA instead of having an outside shell and then only changing the inner parts. And that means that we kind of, instead of starting at an XE interface, we instead kind of start with uh, the PCIe interface directly. And what basically uh, the AWS shell, at least as far as I can tell users, and probably x 2 as well, is a Silings uh, IP called XDMA that provides these interfaces and can be configured to provide, in our case, exactly one 32-bit XE Lite interface and one 512-bit XE4 DMA interface. And that's kind of a quite easy way to get this started. The issue is that if you do this yourself, you don't have drivers. So what you have to do is access the PCIe bar directly in order to communicate um, with the MMIO interface, while for DMA, you can still use the XDMA driver. But that means that there are some things that are not as elegant as kind of in an out of the box solution. Then what are kind of the benefits of having FireSim on the U250? The first benefit is it's 30% larger than uh, the F1. And that means that you can potentially fit a bigger design. Then you have a slimmer shell, so you can fit an even bigger design. And in general, because you kind of have the more localized FPGA flow and don't have to deal with things like having encrypted bit streams and all that kind of thing, you are in some ways just more flexible. And for now, our solution targets only one memory controller because we are fine with just 16 gigabytes of RAM just to avoid additional SLR, so superlogic region crossings, because the superlogic regions are assigned to uh, uh, different uh, DRAM channels. And by just keeping everything in the same superlogic regions, we could keep the design a lot simpler and thus also faster. And another potential benefit could be that you can apply further optimizations to the DMA config and potentially get more bandwidth just because you kind of control the whole PCIe design and can thus kind of specialize more for the specific workload rather than having to be a more generic shell. But it also comes with some issues. PCIe is not really meant to be hot swappable. And there are things like Thunderbolt that make you think that PCIe is hot swappable, but it's kind of a lie. Because what happens is PCIe address space is assigned by the BIOS at boot time. And that means that if you don't have uh, space assigned, there will not be space available and things will just not work. 
And because PCA devices are enumerated in a certain order, the space also needs to be allocated in a certain order. So you can't just kind of append more in the end. And what that means in practice is that switching between the default XRT shell and our FireSim shell requires a reboot because uh, the address space needs to be enumerated. And afterwards, we can just switch between different uh, bit streams that use the same uh, FireSim shell, but we have to temporarily disable PCIe error reporting while flashing the bit stream because the PCIe interface goes down and otherwise there would be errors and the system could potentially crash. And this is finally also the approach that Silex took with the OpenNIC platform because they kind of ran into the same issues. So there's a script available there that does that. Then the other thing is, now that we kind of no longer have fancy partial reconfiguration via PCIe, we still need to flash the bitstream somehow. And there's a port available on the back of the FPGA for this, just a USB port that provides JTAG, but it's not really meant to be used, I think, because it's kind of in an unfortunate position that means that at least in the server we used, we had to shave down a cable to actually make it work. And you then have USB cables sticking out of the back of your server, which is not ideal and might not be something that, for example, is possible in like the AMD or Silinx clusters. One thing we also did, because we mostly use it for FireSim, is to flash the bitstream into the ROM so it's kind of permanent and even a cold reboot uh, reverts to the FireSim shell. But by default, if you just flash the bitstream with our method, the next time you do turn off the power, it will go back to XRT. So it's kind of non-permanent in that sense. So it's kind of not dangerous to try out in a way. Then all of this is kind of a bit cumbersome at first. So something that Bjorn mostly worked on is simplify uh, flashing bit streams using a single command and also controlling allocation of FPGAs so that you can specifically reserve an FPGA, then have exclusive access to it. And this also takes care of kind of reowning the respective interfaces, making sure that only one person tries to use an FPGA at a time because otherwise things will get quite messy. And we really don't want everyone to have sudo who has to use this. So what we ended up doing is adding this script that manages this to the sudoers file. So this script can execute commands as root, but the users themselves don't need root access. Then what are kind of the potential upgrades of this? The first one would be to create a real shell. And we are not the only people with these issues. I kind of heard of several like university clusters that more or less have this issue because either you do things only the silence well way with XRT, but then you're quite limited, or you kind of do something more custom. And there are definitely better ways to do this more custom. And the XDMA IP, for example, already includes some things that are meant for partial reconfiguration. It just takes engineering effort. And so far we didn't have kind of the time or the need for this, so we didn't do it. And even in this scenario, switching back and forth from XRT would still require kind of flashing via JTAG because there you need to replace the whole design instead of just uh, the reconfigurable part inside the shell. One way to kind of at least make switching a bit more simple it could be to try to match the PCIe behavior. So uh, which kind of parts of the, which bars are available and how much address space they use to the XRT shell, because then it could kind of reuse the allocation previously used for XRT for the FireSim shell and would no longer require a reboot. But so far, this is kind of an untested theory. So it could work, but the question is, is it worth to kind of spend the effort doing that rather than finding a better long-term solution? And one hope we kind of have is that maybe in the future, XRT will kind of be extended to provide a better support for 
user managed kernels and also provide direct X uh, DMA, direct DMA instead just of just DMA to main memory, because that would allow directly using something like FireSim and also enable a lot more like more custom FPGA workloads. And then the final upgrade that we are kind of in talks about is getting this upstream so it's kind of more easily accessible. And then one final thing I wanted to talk about, which has nothing to do with U250, is that it might be interesting to have kind of a more entry-level platform for FireSim. And a platform that could be quite interesting there is the Crea KV260. This is a platform that AMD heavily markets towards like AI, ML, and whatever. And that's why it's quite cheap. So it has 256 k logic cells. So less than a sixth of the U250, but for simple rock designs, this should easily be enough. And it would kind of allow using the infrastructure that FireSim provides for having like real performance evaluation instead of just having an FPGA prototype by using things like phased and by having all the benefits of the like reproducibility and so on. And I think this should not be very complex in theory, but in practice, it needs cross compilation to ARM for the host code. And at the moment, FireSim is built in a way that some libraries are pre compiled. So it's not just swapping out the compiler in one position, but it would have to happen in several. But I think that would be something that could be quite interesting and might benefit FireSim in the long term. And that's it for me. Are there any questions? So I guess one question that I had here, um, I can just, yeah, just like there's there. uh, one question that I have is you speak to how your shell is slimmer. So you say that U250 is 30% larger in terms of LUTs, and then the shell is generally slimmer, the one that you have. Yes. Is there any sort of like, other than area trade-offs, is there like, like more power drop because your shell doesn't do any sort of like power management things or clock management things. So like, is there any implications of having your own shell? Not as far as I'm aware of. And then I guess the other question here is uh, you talked a little bit about, you know, you're able to actually potentially clock things a lot higher because you have a simpler shell that only spans one SLR region or super logic region. Um, do you have any sort of numbers about like how fast you can clock like a default design in FireSim or? Sorry, I, I, was, I was able to uh, get the clock for rocket with like 160 megahertz uh, running on the And like I said before, the summit team all the tracing and matching uh, in megahertz. Thanks. Yes. Um, let's say I have another. Um, Good fixed ultra scale, how much effort would it be to port it to such a FPGA? I think not a lot of effort because, in essence, it's just kind of creating a new block design, plopping down the XDMA, configuring it, adding a memory interface generator, and that's basically it. Because the design is quite simple. Of course, there's like some additional things like uh, clock frequency conversion, but it's really not very complex. Yeah, one question. Um, you proposed a zinc board, a zinc board, but uh, if I remember correctly, some of the issues is that are that the zinc system, um, the memory maps and other things are slightly different, like how you connect the DRAM and the zinc system is slightly different from the business perspective. If you look at you know, code that uh, accesses that FPGA. Is that going to be an issue because the system will look a little bit different for your shell? Because it doesn't look like a traditional like U250 or U bit or something. That... I mean, I think as long as kind of a continuous memory region is provided for phased, I don't think that should be an issue. And other than that, it's just the Axilite interface because. I think for for this kind of more entry level platform, DMA probably doesn't provide as much benefit. So I think mostly having it as 
a kind of simple way to get deterministic and realistic performance results from chipyard designs would be a good starting point. Okay, last question over Slack here. Have you performed any analysis on how many hours you need to use your on-premise fire some server, including the cost of the FPGA, the cost of the server and other required components to break even compared to AWS? Uh, we have not really performed that analysis because I think in many cases, there is kind of funding available for projects. And if you either use, you use it and buy something and keep it, or you don't. So I think for universities, in many cases, even if it kind of is technically more expensive, you kind of gain long-term infrastructure versus gaining like a single run of something. 